Personal Jurisdiction Part 1 in Personam Jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction has three forms, in personam, in rem, and quasi in rem. In this session, I'm going to talk about in personam jurisdiction. In rem and quasi in rem are also part of personal jurisdiction, but will be covered in a separate video. This is a glimpse of the analysis roadmap we will be going through. As in my other videos, we will be discussing this step by step and going over each part of the analysis. But first, let's do a really quick intro. As you know, there are two forms of jurisdiction and a court needs both in order to adjudicate a case. There will also need to be proper venue, but venue is not really jurisdiction and it's a separate video as well. The court needs power over the type of case, which is subject matter jurisdiction. The court also needs power to bind the parties in the case in the case of in personam jurisdiction or to bind the property in the case of in rem or quasi in rem, which is a separate video. But in this video, we're discussing in personam jurisdiction, the court's power over the person or entity being sued. And what do I mean by entity? I mean like a corporation, like an organization. Many, if not most of your personal jurisdiction cases and fact patterns will be about asserting personal jurisdiction over a corporation or another type of business entity. Subject matter jurisdiction is the power of a court to enter a judgment on the type of case. For example, a federal court has the authority to decide a case that arises under federal law. A federal court also has the power, not exclusive, but still has the power to hear and decide a case between citizens of different states, provided the lawsuit is for more than $75,000. A federal bankruptcy court is the only one allowed to decide a bankruptcy case, and a state court is the only one allowed to hear and decide divorces. With subject matter jurisdiction, we're talking about the court's power over the type of case, whereas in personam jurisdiction involves the ability of a court to legally bind the defendant to its decision, to its judgment whether that defendant is a person or a corporation or any other type of entity. It's the power of a court to enter a binding judgment governing the rights and obligations of the parties in the case. So if you were to receive a letter from a court in Zimbabwe telling you to pay Ted Smith $10,000, you would wonder what gives that court the power to enforce this decision upon you, right? What gives the Zimbabwe court the power to tell me what to do or who to pay? Well, this is what we're going to explore. As you know, the U.S. has more than one court system. So one thing I want you to know is that whether we're dealing with a state court or a federal court, a court's power to legally bind a defendant to its decision depends on the relationship between the defendant and the forum state, the state where the lawsuit is filed. This means that a Florida state court and a federal court that's located in the state of Florida will follow the same personal jurisdiction rules. The federal court must employ the state law governing personal jurisdiction that is applicable in the state in which the federal court is located. All right, so in general, how will your analysis play out with personal jurisdiction? Well, so in personam jurisdiction has two essential components, state statutory sources of personal jurisdiction and constitutional limitations to personal jurisdiction. I want you to understand that states are sovereign governments. They create and determine their own personal jurisdiction rules, and these rules are called long-arm statutes. So yes, you heard right. The rules on whether a state has personal jurisdiction over a defendant is left to each individual state. But that's kind of like a kid making up his own curfew or her own house rules. So we come across the issue that if the states themselves are creating their own personal jurisdiction rules... If each state gets to decide under what circumstances its courts can legally bind a defendant to a judgment, that seems like a lot of power, especially a lot of power to be untethered, unchecked. This is why these rules, these state laws, also called long-arm statutes, are subject to checks, to constitutional checks. In fact, they're subject to constitutional limitations. Why constitutional limitations? This part is very important. Because of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, it forbids states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It means that during our analysis of impersonum jurisdiction, we need to check two boxes, procedural due process and substantive due process. A court cannot run afoul of the 14th Amendment. Procedural due process means fair judicial proceedings. This means notice, opportunity to be heard, and an impartial tribunal, meaning an impartial decision maker. Substantive due process is a principle to prevent government interference with fundamental rights. 
And what are fundamental rights? Fundamental rights are a group of rights that have been recognized by the Supreme Court as requiring a high degree of protection from government encroachment. These rights are identified in the Constitution. One place will be in the Bill of Rights, but it's not just the Bill of Rights. Another place where you can find fundamental rights is under due process. So circling back, how does this relate to personal jurisdiction? Well, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment forbids states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In a lawsuit, for example, a court, which is a government entity, is making a decision potentially disposing of someone's property, right? That's why due process is triggered. Like I said, states create their own jurisdictional laws, and a state statute allows for courts within its boundaries to make a decision that affects someone's life, liberty, or property. These laws granting jurisdiction must meet constitutional safeguards. So this is why we do the due process analysis, which is twofold. Procedural due process, which, by the way, is where you will be doing your analysis for whether there was proper service of process. In substantive due process, no encroaching on a person's fundamental rights. That's where the minimum contact analysis comes in. And that's going to be the focus in this lesson, the minimum context analysis. Let's begin. First things first, personal jurisdiction can be waived, agreed upon, or consented to. You can read more about this in detail in your outline or in the outline that I provide. It is important, but it's not something that's difficult to understand, so I haven't done a video on it yet. I might do one later. But please make sure that you understand the concept of waiver or consent when it comes to personal jurisdiction. And this brings me to step zero. This is what you need to look at first. Has the defendant waived, agreed upon, or consented to personal jurisdiction? If yes, provided there is proper notice, opportunity to be heard, and impartial tribunal, then there is personal jurisdiction. If the answer is no, then you go to the roadmap. There are several ways a defendant can waive, agree upon, or consent to personal jurisdiction, and I'm really going to try to do a video on it. Otherwise, please read it in my outline. But before you look at the roadmap, please make sure that you look at step zero. And if the defendant has not waived, agreed upon, or consented to personal jurisdiction, then go to the roadmap. Here is the roadmap with which we will be working. As you can see, there are two parts, part one and part two. We will begin with part one on the left. And here's part one singled out. First, we will ask if there is a state long arm statute. Long arm jurisdiction refers to the power of a court in one state to assert personal jurisdiction over a person in another state. Every state has a law called a long arm statute, which details under what circumstances a court in a state may assert personal jurisdiction over an out of state defendant. This means that, absent consent or waiver, when a court exercises personal jurisdiction, it must do so pursuant to an explicit grant of authority in a state statute, or else the court may not exercise personal jurisdiction. No long arm statute, no PJ you do not get to go to the minimum contacts test. There are limited long-arm statutes and unlimited long-arm statutes. Limited statutes specify situations that give rights to personal jurisdiction. For example, state A has a statute allowing a state to exercise personal jurisdiction over a non-resident defendant who transacts business within the state boundaries. Unlimited long-arm statutes allow for any situation to give rise to personal jurisdiction so long as it's within the constitutional bounds. For example, State B has a long-arm statute that gives courts power over any personal property over which the state can constitutionally exercise jurisdiction. To me, that's the equivalent of the grown-ups that say, if your mom's okay with it, then I'm okay with it. You're allowed to do anything that your mom is okay with you doing. Now, is this super important? I personally don't think so. Just remember that with limited long-arm statutes, we're making sure the situation the statute says gives rise to personal jurisdiction, whether it's transacting business in the state, getting into a car accident in the state, driving through the state. We need to make sure the situation the statute says gives rise to personal jurisdiction, the conduct the statute says gives rise to personal jurisdiction, rises to the standard of minimum context required by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Constitution analysis. This way, we make sure the state statute is not asserting personal jurisdiction in violation of a person's or entity's due process rights. 
for unlimited long-arm statutes, we're just acknowledging there's a long-arm statute and moving directly to the constitutional limitations. Because all the statute is saying is the court can exercise personal jurisdiction under any situation as long as it's constitutional. You understand what I mean? We are checking that the conduct or the relationship between defendant and the forum state rises to the standard of minimum context required by the Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court. So for step one, just check in your fact pattern if there's a long-arm statute. Almost always, if not always, there will be one. Acknowledge it, mention in your answer that there's a long-arm statute. Brownie points if you tell the reader if it's a limited or unlimited long-arm statute. Make sure it applies to the facts or events in your fact pattern, that it applies to the defendant in your fact pattern. Then move on to the constitutional analysis to check that the long-arm statute and or the relationship between the defendant and the form state passes the minimum context test. Moving on, I want to note a small wrinkle. Defendant's physical presence in the form state when served with service of process gives rise to personal jurisdiction. Usually, no minimum context analysis is required unless your professor wants it. The Supreme Court has already deemed that physical presence of the defendant in the forum state when she served with process gives rise to personal jurisdiction in that state. It's a little bit controversial and it's definitely an outlier. When we go through the case law, when we go through the jurisprudence on personal jurisdiction, you're going to say, how does physical presence in the forum state when served with process meet minimum context? It doesn't really seem to fit. But this is actually a traditional basis for personal jurisdiction. But you need to know that physical presence in the forum state when served with process for a lawsuit in that state, regardless of whether your presence is related to the lawsuit or not, grants that forum state personal jurisdiction over you, over the defendant. So if you go to California to Disneyland with your family and someone serves you with service of process on a lawsuit that's filed in California, California has personal jurisdiction over your person. They can bind you to a judgment. Remember, if the defendant has clearly consented to or waived personal jurisdiction, there is personal jurisdiction. You might have to do an analysis on whether the consent or waiver was valid and sufficient. Also, if the defendant was served with process in the forum state on a lawsuit filed in that state, there is personal jurisdiction. In that case, you might have to do an analysis on whether service of process was properly effectuated, right? All right, guys, let's get to the meat. Part 2, Constitutional Limitations, Minimum Context Test. Now, in this lesson, I'm not going to go over International Shoe versus Washington, but I am going to tell you the part that I think is important. In order for a court to exercise personal jurisdiction over a defendant in a manner consistent with the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, the defendant must have minimum contacts with a forum state such that it would not be unfair to force the defendant to defend a lawsuit there. This standard has become known as the minimum context test. If personal jurisdiction is challenged by the defendant and a plaintiff cannot demonstrate that the minimum context test is satisfied, then the court may not exercise personal jurisdiction and therefore may not hear the case absent, of course, consent or waiver. One important thing I'd like to note is that minimum contacts does not equal minimal contacts. Minimal contacts is not a thing. Nobody's asking you to judge or use your criteria to determine if minimal contacts are met or if the defendant has minimal contacts with a forum state. Minimum contacts is a term of art. It's a legal standard set forth by the U.S. Supreme Court. There's a roadmap to the minimum context analysis. I want to mention this because I see students making this mistake all the time. No such thing as minimal context. Minimum context is a legal standard, a term of art, and we're going to go over it. Here is the minimum context part of our analysis. Step one was to check that there is a long arm statute. And what the statute says are the situations where their courts can exercise personal jurisdiction over a defendant. Step two is to first determine whether there is general jurisdiction or specific jurisdiction. This will affect your analysis completely. The U.S. Supreme Court has recognized two types of in personam jurisdiction. General jurisdiction, also called all-purpose jurisdiction, and specific jurisdiction, 
also called case-linked jurisdiction. I will begin with general jurisdiction. The key term for general jurisdiction is essentially at home. That's what I want you guys to remember, essentially at home, which is also a term of art. It's also a legal standard. If a court has general jurisdiction over a person or entity, that person or entity can be sued in that court in that state, regardless of where the actions underlying the lawsuit occurred. A court has general jurisdiction over a defendant if the court itself, whether state or federal, is located in the state where the defendant is essentially at home. And this is a little different for humans, LLCs, and corporations. For humans, it's domicile. For LLCs, it's every state where each member is domiciled. And what is domicile? Domicile is the place where the defendant resides with an intent to remain indefinitely. In simple words, the state where defendant lives and intends to remain indefinitely is fair game to be sued, even if the events that give rise to the cause of action happened somewhere else. So if a defendant is sued in Alabama, courts located in the state of Alabama, whether it's a state Alabama court or whether it's a federal court, may assert personal jurisdiction over defendant for stuff that happened anywhere in the world. So if this same defendant commits a tort in Georgia and the plaintiff chooses to sue defendant in Alabama, the Alabama court will have power to legally bind defendant to its decision of the case. And this is true even though the conduct that is subject to the lawsuit occurred in Georgia. Why? A plaintiff can always sue this defendant in Alabama, regardless of where the cause of action occurred, because defendant is at home in Alabama. So, can defendant be sued in Alabama if the conduct giving rise to the lawsuit happened in Alabama? Yes. Obviously, right? Absolutely. What if the conduct giving rise to the lawsuit happened in New York? Also, yes. The defendant can be sued in Alabama. What if the conduct giving rise to the lawsuit happened in Japan? Yes. What if the conduct giving rise to the lawsuit happened in Wakanda? Yes. Narnia? Yes. If the defendant is domiciled in Alabama, It's fair game to sue that defendant in Alabama, regardless where the cause of action arose. Okay, to recap, humans are essentially at home in their domicile. LLCs are essentially at home in every state where each member is domiciled. What about corporations? This is important because this is highly tested. A state may exercise general jurisdiction over corporations when their affiliations with the state are so continuous and systematic as to render them essentially at home. That's the standard. Now, I want you to note that in 2017, the understanding of this rule for general jurisdiction shifted in BNSF versus Tyrell. If you're looking at online materials, please note that the systematic and continuous activity test has been almost eliminated, even though the rule hasn't really changed. Let me explain this to you a little further. Bear with me on this because this is really, really, really important, okay? So in BNSF v. Tyrell, plaintiff brought suit in Montana against the railway, incorporated in Delaware with its principal place of business in Texas. The lawsuit was based on an incident that happened in Washington. The plaintiff alleged general jurisdiction. So plaintiff was alleging that Railway was essentially at home in Montana, right? Why? Well, Railway had 2,000 miles of track and 2,000 employees in Montana. So the plaintiff figured, yeah, this should meet continuous and systematic, right? Continuous and systematic contacts with the forum state, Montana. All right, so pay attention to this. Here is the rule again. A state may exercise general jurisdiction over a corporation when the corporation's affiliations with the state are so continuous and systematic as to render them essentially at home. Now, the plaintiff argued that the railway's contacts with the state, with Montana, approximately 2,000 employees and 2,000 miles of railroad track 
brought it within the reach of Montana's long-arm statute under general jurisdiction because these contacts were so continuous and systematic. The Supreme Court in this case confirmed the established rule. A state may exercise personal jurisdiction over corporations when their affiliations with the state are so continuous and systematic as to render them essentially at home. The problem is that we, the lay people, we were under the impression that continuous and systematic contacts was the key, was the standard, that continuous and systematic was the golden nugget, if you will. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. Continuous and systematic contacts as to render defendant essentially at home. Don't forget about the essentially at home part. The Supreme Court emphasized and gave more importance to that part of the test, essentially at home. This is so important, guys. Think about it. General jurisdiction in a state means that defendant can be sued in that state for stuff that happened anywhere in the world. So the U.S. Supreme Court said no general jurisdiction in Montana over the railway. So the court did not have personal jurisdiction over their railway. Yes, the corporation has 2,000 employees in Montana. Yes, it has 2,000 miles of railroad track in Montana. But this does not render them essentially at home for purposes of general jurisdiction. The test for in personam jurisdiction under general jurisdiction is not whether you have property in the forum state or whether you do business in the forum state or you have lots of contacts with the forum state. The test for general jurisdiction over a corporation is grounded in the term essentially at home. So the state of incorporation or principal place of business. And where is the principal place of business? Well, headquarters or the nerve center of the company, right? The single place where corporations officers direct, control, and coordinate the corporation's activities. So remember, state of incorporation, principal place of business are what? the two locations where the corporation is considered a citizen, right? This is why I said that the rule has shifted but not really changed. The Supreme Court just made us aware that it's not that the activities of a corporation have to be systematic and continuous. They have to be systematic and continuous so as to render the defendant at home in that state. And it said explicitly, place of incorporation, principal place of business. It is important, however, that I note that the Supreme Court did leave the door open for exceptional cases. Let me talk about this just a little tiny bit. Bear with me, okay? So in Daimler, a different case, the court stated, we do not foreclose the possibility that in an exceptional case, see Perkins, a corporation's operations in a forum other than its formal place of incorporation or principal place of business may be so substantial and of such a nature as to render the corporation at home in that state. Whoa, plot twist. Who needs TikTok when you have this content, right? Let's look at Perkins since they gave us the example of Perkins. So in Perkins, the defendant corporation had essentially set up a home away from home in Ohio while its Philippine operations were suspended during the Japanese occupation in World War II. General jurisdiction was found despite Ohio not being where it was formally incorporated or its usual principal place of business. So Perkins might be an example, or so it seems, of a time where contacts are so continuous and so systematic such that it renders defendant at home somewhere other than its place of incorporation or official principal place of business. It's an exceptional case. And the reason, and probably the sole reason, that the defendant in Perkins was considered to be at home in Ohio was that it was shut out of its actual home during the war and set up a temporary home in Ohio. So once again, to recap... Humans are essentially at home in their domicile, LLCs, every state where each member is domiciled. Incorporations are essentially at home in their state of incorporation or their principal place of business. And there is a little bit of an open door for very exceptional cases where the corporation really does have such systematic and continuous contacts with the forum state as to render it essentially at home. Okay, this is where we are in our roadmap. 
we're still in general jurisdiction. I want to talk very quickly about why I have not included the reasonableness factors in general jurisdiction. As you can see, I have included these factors under specific jurisdiction, but I want to explain why I did not include them under general jurisdiction. See, in Daimler, and you don't need to know all of the facts for this explanation, Justice Ginsburg rendered the majority opinion on a matter of general jurisdiction. In doing so, she reiterated that general jurisdiction for a corporation, it's where it's incorporated and or principal place of business. The court found no general jurisdiction in this case in Daimler. However, Justice Sonia Sotomayor concurred with the majority opinion. Concurring is when you arrive at the same conclusion, but for different reasons. You have a different opinion than the majority on how you arrive to that conclusion, to that judgment, to that decision. Justice Sonia Sotomayor concurred with the majority, but wanted the reasonableness factors from Asahi to form part of the general jurisdiction analysis. Justice Ginsburg, in turn, used footnote 20 of the opinion in Daimler to address the use of the reasonableness analysis for general jurisdiction cases. And here it is, footnote 20. True, a multi-pronged reasonableness check was articulated in Asahi, but not as a free-floating test. Instead, the check was to be essayed when specific jurisdiction is at issue. First, a court is to determine whether the connection between the forum and the episode in suit could justify the exercise of specific jurisdiction. Then, in a second step, the court is to consider several additional factors to assess the reasonableness of entertaining the case. When a corporation is genuinely at home in the forum state, however, any second step inquiry would be superfluous. Whoa, right? What this tells me is that when a defendant is genuinely at home, principal place of business, state of incorporation, no reasonableness factors are necessary when exercising general jurisdiction like that. However, I personally think, and this is my own opinion, this is my own personal opinion, that it does leave the door open to use the Asahi reasonableness factors in those very exceptional cases of general jurisdiction that we just talked about now where the corporation isn't technically at home, it's not in its principal place of business, it's not in the state where it's incorporated, but like in Perkins, the contacts with the forum are so systematic and continuous that they would be considered at home. I guess we can keep an eye on that in the next few years and see what the court does with it. So, what I'm saying is that when general jurisdiction is based on the corporation being really truly at home, meaning principal place of business, state of incorporation, no reasonableness analysis is necessary according to RBG in footnote 20 of Daimler. In fact, in footnote 20 of Daimler, Justice Ginsburg went a little further and stated explicitly that Justice Sotomayor's proposal to import Asahi's reasonableness check into the general jurisdiction determination would indeed compound the jurisdictional inquiry. It would make it too much. Then she went on to list the reasonableness factors identified in Asahi, and she stated, imposing such a checklist in cases of general jurisdiction would hardly promote the efficient disposition of an issue that should be resolved expeditiously at the outset of litigation. So RBG and the majority disagreed with Justice Sotomayor, even though it's only a footnote, it clearly indicates that when defendant is genuinely at home, reasonableness is implied and the reasonableness factors from Asahi are superfluous. So, check this with your law professor, but this is what I think. For those of you taking the bar, make sure that you check this with your bar materials before you create your own step-by-step -step roadmap analysis, okay? I did include the reasonableness factors under specific jurisdiction. But first, let's conclude general jurisdiction. Let's talk about the major points very quickly. Systematic and continuous contacts alone are not sufficient for general jurisdiction. The defendant must have systematic and continuous contacts that render it essentially at home. For corporations, home is and will almost always be principal place of business or place of incorporation. For individuals, home is domicile. For LLC, 
every state where any member is domiciled. Remember, the reasonableness factors are likely not used anymore for general jurisdiction when defendant is genuinely at home. See footnote 20. Now let's move on to specific jurisdiction. This is my summary roadmap for specific jurisdiction part one, since after this, you will need to do the reasonableness factors. A court has specific jurisdiction over a defendant if the actions or events giving rise to the cause of action arise out or relate to the defendant's contacts with the forum state. Example, defendant opens a nail salon in state A and several of the salon's patrons contact a fungus on their nails. These patrons sue defendant in state A for personal injuries. Let's say that the principal place of business and the state of incorporation for this nail salon, this chain of nail salons, is elsewhere, not in state A. So you don't have general jurisdiction. Now you need to turn to spe- So now you need to turn to specific jurisdiction. Because the offending conduct, the cause of action, the facts that led to the cause of action happened in state A, then there is specific jurisdiction to sue the nail salon in state A. Even though the corporation is incorporated elsewhere and the principal place of business of this business is in another state, the offending conduct, the facts that give rise to the cause of action happened in state A. The fungus occurred in state A, and therefore there is specific jurisdiction amounting to the personal jurisdiction required for the court to have power over this corporation. Specific jurisdiction is more complex than general jurisdiction. General jurisdiction now is more straightforward, and therefore specific jurisdiction lends itself more to testing. So this is where the meat is, guys. Don't fall asleep on me just yet. Like I said previously, specific jurisdiction happens when plaintiff's claims arise out of or relate to the defendant's activities in the forum state. The relate to part infers that some relationships will support specific jurisdiction without a causal showing. The case law before focused on the arise out of portion. But in Ford, the Supreme Court reminded us that the test also says, or relate to. In 2021, the Supreme Court issued its newest ruling on personal jurisdiction in the consolidated cases of Ford Motor Company versus Montana and Ford Motor Company versus Bandimer. Let's talk about Ford. Ford defendant was sued in Montana and Minnesota from accidents that happened in these states involving Ford vehicles. Now, Ford defendant is incorporated in Delaware and has its principal place of business in Michigan. So we know there is no general jurisdiction there, right? Not at home in Montana or Minnesota, and no contacts have been alleged that would amount to an exceptional case, right? So specific jurisdiction was at issue here. Ford's argument was that personal jurisdiction was lacking because the specific cars in question were neither designed nor manufactured nor sold within the forum states, Montana and Minnesota, meaning there was no direct causal link. But the court said yes to specific jurisdiction in Montana and Minnesota and allowed Ford to be sued there. So as we know, for specific jurisdiction, the plaintiff's claims must arise out or relate to the defendant's activities in the forum state. The relate to part is where the court focused. The court rejected Ford's causal link argument and explained that it was enough that Ford cultivated and served a market in both states, Montana and Minnesota, for the car models involved in the accidents in that plaintiff's claims were closely related to those in-state activities. Some say that this case expanded specific jurisdiction, but I don't really think so. I disagree with that. That's a personal opinion. I think it followed precedent accurately. I think the reality is that legal scholars, as well as professors, as well as students, simply disregarded the part that says relate to, arise out of, or relate to. I've seen a lot of outlines, a lot of material online, there's a lot of junk material online, and they also disregard the relate to part of the rule. It has always been a rise out of or relate to. 
I think we lost sight of that because most of the jurisprudence in specific jurisdiction has involved a rise out of portion of the rule. So the relate to part means that some relationships will support specific jurisdiction without a causal showing, without the arise out of portion, without that cause and effect. Just a relationship between the facts that give rise to the cause of action in the defendant's context with the forum state. Okay, now let's talk about purposeful availment and foreseeability. Purposeful availment first. Defendant, through its contacts with the forum state, must have purposefully availed itself of the privilege of conducting activities within the forum state, thus invoking the benefits and protections of its laws. So defendant's contacts with the forum state must be purposeful and intentional rather than merely fortuitous or unintended. This means that the contacts with the forum state must not be accidental or inadvertent. You can see this in Worldwide Volkswagen. So in this case, defendant, a New York car dealer, was sued in Oklahoma based on an accident that happened in Oklahoma. Now, the only basis for personal jurisdiction over defendant was the sale of a defective car in New York by defendant who did not know the car would end up in Oklahoma. The court found there was no purposeful availment of the privileges or protections of Oklahoma. So this plaintiff purchased a car in New York and drove it to Oklahoma. The fact that defendant did not know the car would end up in Oklahoma, he did not take it to Oklahoma, he did not sell it in Oklahoma, he sold it to somebody who ended up taking it to Oklahoma. Therefore, the court said no personal jurisdiction because the defendant contacts with the forum state were not purposeful. In simple words, the defendant's actions must be intentionally directed into the forum. So it's not even enough that the defendant knows it's going to end up in Oklahoma. It needs to be intentionally directed into the forum state. Here is another illustration. Burger King, a Florida corporation sued defendant who was domiciled in Michigan, sued this defendant in Florida on a contract matter. What were defendant's contacts with the state of Florida? Well, defendant entered into a franchise contract with a Florida corporation, with Burger King. Contract provided for franchise fees to be sent to Florida, and the contract provided that disputes would be resolved using Florida law not necessarily in Florida, but using Florida law. The court found that defendant purposefully availed itself of the privileges of conducting activities within the forum state, thus invoking the benefits and protections of its laws. In this case, the defendant's contacts that give rise to or were related to the cause of action were intentional and directed at Florida. Now let's talk about foreseeability. This is where we are on the roadmap. I emphasize the plus sign before it because I want you to remember that it's not a standalone test. It piggybacks on purposeful availment. So let's talk about it. For purposes of in personam jurisdiction by way of specific jurisdiction, foreseeability means that the defendant must know or reasonably anticipate that her activities in the forum render it foreseeable that she may be hailed into court there. That's from International Shoe. That's the wording I want you to use. Okay, so this is also important. In Worldwide Volkswagen, the Supreme Court announced that foreseeability alone has never been a sufficient benchmark for personal jurisdiction under the Due Process Clause. It did not dismiss the usage of foreseeability altogether but caution that the foreseeability that is critical to due process analysis is that the defendant's conduct in connection with the forum state are such that he should reasonably anticipate being hailed into court there. What I want you to get from this is that foreseeability cannot stand on its own as a test for minimum contacts, and that defendant's actions, not defendant's expectations, establish minimum contacts. All right, guys, this is where we are now in our in personam jurisdiction analysis step-by-step -step roadmap. The next step is reasonableness, the reasonableness factors. These are the reasonableness factors that we're not doing in general jurisdiction, but I am still including in specific jurisdiction. 
Reasonableness means that exercising jurisdiction would not offend traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. This is the wording I want you to use. There are five factors that the court in Asahi laid out. Now remember, these are not elements. These are factors. Elements are conditions that you must meet, whereas factors are considerations that you must weigh in order to make a decision to reach a determination. In Asahi, the court set forth five factors to consider, to weigh, to determine whether exercising specific jurisdiction would be reasonable. I do want to know an important part of the application when you're applying the reasonableness factors. Please check this with your law professor just in case she wants it different for whatever reason. Okay, if purposeful availment and foreseeability are shown in the previous step, the court will presume reasonableness. The burden regarding reasonableness then shifts from plaintiff to defendant, and now defendant has the burden of showing a compelling case, that's the standard of proof, a compelling case of unreasonableness. So, to determine reasonableness or unreasonableness, we consider the following. Hardship on the defendant to litigate in a forum state, plaintiff's interest in obtaining convenient and effective relief, forum state's interest in adjudicating the matter, judicial efficiency, and furthering fundamental social policies. Let's talk about these factors individually. I promise to be quick. What I want you to keep in mind, though, is that it's the defendant that must show true hardship, not just inconvenience. The hardship on defendant of litigating the case in a forum state actually carries a heavy burden of proof. In Asahi, it was established that the hardship on a foreign corporation of litigating a case in the forum state, the state where the lawsuit is filed, is severe. That's the word Justice O'Connor used. So this hardship was weighed heavily in favor of unreasonableness, meaning it was unreasonable to force defendant to litigate the matter in the forum state. In Carnival Cruz, mirrored hardship in defending the lawsuit in the forum state did not meet the heavy burden of hardship to set aside a standard forum selection clause. A forum selection clause, by the way, is a provision in a contract where the parties agree in advance where a suit will be litigated in case a disagreement between the parties gives rise to legal action. In this case, the parties had initially agreed on a forum selection clause. They had pre-selected where litigation would occur should a dispute arise. However, this clause, it was not negotiated. It was sort of hidden in one of those forms that you just have to agree to in order to conclude a purchase. In fact, it was written in the actual cruise ticket and it said, if anything happens and you sue us or we sue you, the litigation has to happen in Florida. So this couple from Michigan, they were injured in the cruise line, in Carnival Cruise Line. They sued in Washington because they were from Washington and they're just a regular couple. Carnival said, no, you have to sue us in Florida. You agreed to when you purchased your tickets, when you accepted your tickets. The lower court in this case agreed with the Michigan couple. You can't just drag this poor little couple all the way to Florida to litigate this because this form selection clause was not freely bargained for. And its enforcement would operate to deprive this little old couple of their day in court in light of evidence indicating that they were both physically and financially incapable of pursuing this litigation in Florida. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, we're going to side with Carnival Cruise Lines on this one there was a forum selection clause. True that it wasn't negotiated on and it was in the ticket, right? But we're going to require a higher burden of hardship in order to bypass a forum selection clause. So the takeaway is that for burden, for hardship on defendant of litigating the lawsuit in the forum state, we're gonna look for true hardship, not just inconvenience, even if that inconvenience is quite big. True hardship is really the burden of proof in order for defendant to show unreasonableness. Now let's talk about the next one, plaintiff's interest in obtaining convenient and effective relief. This one gets weighed along with the hardship on defendant. If one party is going to travel or bear the greater hardship anyway, it's actually okay for it to be on the defendant. The case of McGee is a prime example of this. We don't want to alter plaintiff's choice of forum unless the burden on defendant is very high. 
Next, let's talk about the forum state's interest in adjudicating the matter. A long-arm statute can serve as evidence of the state's interest in adjudicating a matter. If a cause of action arises out of an enumerated explicit act in a long-arm statute, so a limited long-arm statute, right? That's a very good showing that the state has an interest in adjudicating the matter. In Worldwide Volkswagen, it was determined that an isolated occurrence in the state is not enough. It must be serving that state's market. In Keaton v. Hustler magazine, regular sales in the forum state were enough when it comes to the state's interest in adjudicating the matter. Defendants' regular circulation of magazines in the forum state was sufficient to support an assertion of jurisdiction in a libel action based on the contents of the magazine. The Supreme Court determined that the state's interest in redressing torts occurring within its borders was enough to determine the forum state had a legitimate interest in adjudicating a matter. The court, citing another case, Leeper, stated, A state has a special interest in exercising judicial jurisdiction over those who commit torts within its territory. This is because torts involve a wrongful conduct which a state seeks to deter and against which it attempts to afford protection by providing that a tortfeasor shall be liable for damages which are the proximate result of his tort. In Asahi, a court determined that the state did have a slight interest, but again, you have to weigh these against the other factors. These aren't elements, these are factors. So even though the court in Asahi did find there was a state interest in adjudicating the matter before the court, the burden on defendant to litigate in the forum state was too severe. See, these two factors were weighed together. So for the takeaways, a long-arm statute can serve as evidence of the state's interest in adjudicating a matter. If the cause of action arises out of an enumerated explicit act in a long-arm statute, it's good showing that the state has an interest in adjudicating a matter. An isolated occurrence in a forum state is not enough. It must be serving that state's market. Next, judicial efficiency. Here we're asking the question of whether there is an efficiency reason as to why the particular court should be hearing the case. In Burger King, the parties entered into a contract. And in that contract, there was a choice of law provision. It did not say you have to litigate it in Florida, but it said you have to use Florida law when you're litigating the case, wherever it's litigated. That can happen, by the way. We can talk about that later in choice of laws. So this choice of law provision that Florida law would apply to the party's litigation, to the party's disagreement or conflict, that clause is going to give a good reason for it to be a Florida court who hears the case because who better than a Florida court to apply Florida law? And this happens also if a court has developed an expertise in hearing the type of case that is at bar. That's an issue. So the takeaway is we might be looking at the court that is better equipped to decide a matter effectively and efficiently. And lastly, let's look at furthering fundamental social policies. For this one, I'm going to give you an example because I don't know what fundamental social policies the Supreme Court deems essential or important or fundamental. One good example, though, is Asahi Metal. We don't want foreign corporations to not want to do business in our country in fear of being subject to lawsuits here due to their contacts with the state or the country. So this is how it goes. First, you have to show as a plaintiff purposeful availment and foreseeability. If purposeful availment and foreseeability are shown, then the burden regarding reasonableness shifts to defendant. And now defendant has the burden of showing a compelling case of unreasonableness. That's the standard, the burden of proof. Compelling case of unreasonableness. And the factors to examine are the ones we just covered. Remember that we're looking at this as defendant showing. All right, guys, we've reached the end of our lecture. Here is the roadmap for you to look at. And here's a cleaner, nicer version of this roadmap. I am going to upload this so that you can access it and download it, or you can take a screenshot or whatever you want. I do want to hold you hostage just one more minute to make some final points about minimum contacts. I want you to remember that for specific jurisdiction, defendants may have sufficient contacts with the forum state to support constitutionally required minimum contacts, even though defendant did not act within the state. 
Unrelated but also important, I want you to remember that minimum context analysis focuses on the defendant's context at the time the defendant acted. We're determining the minimum context at the time the events that give rise to the lawsuit occurred, not at the time the lawsuit was actually filed. Also, unrelated but important is that I want you to remember that for personal jurisdiction that is based solely on service of process, now this form of jurisdiction has already been determined to be constitutional, right? It's surprising to everyone because this means that if you decide to go to California for vacation and you're served with process in California, a California court has jurisdiction over your person. It has the ability to enter a binding judgment against you. The plaintiff can actually sue you in California even though you're just going there for vacation with your family to Disneyland. This is quite contradictory to the case law that we've been examining where the court gives a high standard to the due process rights of a person or entity. So it's a little bit controversial, but it's already been established and there is personal jurisdiction solely on service of process when the defendant is present in the form state when she's properly served with the summons and complaint. Next, a lot of students like it when I do these little comparisons, so I'm going to go through this very quickly, okay? Distinguishing subject matter jurisdiction from personal jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction is the power of the court to adjudicate the type of case before it. Personal jurisdiction is the power of a court to legally bind a person or an entity, an organization, to rights and obligations. Subject matter jurisdiction is a question of the court's authority over the type of case. And personal jurisdiction is a matter that hinges on the voluntary relationship between the defendant and the state where the suit is filed. Subject matter jurisdiction can never, ever be waived. It cannot be conferred by the court. It cannot be consented to by the parties. It cannot be agreed upon by the parties. There has to be subject matter jurisdiction or your case is dismissed. Even after years of litigation, even after a final judgment has been rendered, if anyone finds out there was no subject matter jurisdiction, the judgment is null and void. Whereas personal jurisdiction, it can be waived, it can be consented to, it can be agreed upon by the parties. Also keep in mind that both personal jurisdiction and venue are a matter of geographic location and they're inevitably interrelated. So please don't forget to watch my video on venue. I really hope this video was valuable to you. If this is how you're feeling after this lecture, please email me to questions at jdsimplified.com.